main purpose here this morning is for me to continue this journey through Acts. I was sharing earlier, um, I really love the fact, again, it said something to me about this church. I've had a little bit of time with your elders who are great men and women. I've grown very fond of them very quickly. Um, you're very blessed to have leadership, uh, spiritual leadership like them. And it really said something to me that you've chosen to actually take a whole book and journey through it. Um, and resonates because actually for about six years in the church that I was the pastor, we had one teaching series for t- six years. We called it the Kingdom of God. We started at Genesis 1 and we just went through verse by verse, chapter by chapter, the narrative, God's story. And really uh, our expectation and our hope, and it was actually so much bigger than that, our experience, was that we would find our place as God's people in his bigger story. Because that, that, that's what this is about, right? This is not our story or your story as a church. We're playing a part in something much bigger. And so to go very deliberately through that was incredibly rich, and uh, particularly the book of Acts. And I think it's, it's really significant. My prayer this morning uh, for all of us, but particularly for you as a church, is that God speaks to you in a way that I guess you're able to, to as we look at the events that are happening in Acts, you're able to not just kind of stand and go, mm, that, that's good, that's, that's true, but actually say, that's true for me. That's true for us. That we would, we would mine deep into God's word and we would find those springs of living water, that we would have the seed of God's word planted in our heart and it would bring forward fruit for you, your family, for this church. So that's my prayer. Is that okay? Can we just assume we've all prayed that? Do I get a yes and amen to that? Great, excellent. We're on the same page. Acts 9. I love this chapter. This is exciting. This, is, this has got a fair bit of drama in it. Are, are you excited? Are you ready for the drama? I wish I had kind of a backing track to me right now. You'll see here I've got, uh, I've named it my little subtitle. You won't find this in the NIV. God knocks Paul off his horse. I'm trying to grab your attention. We do know, you know, that the the road to Damascus, which Paul's on, in all likelihood, it's very, very, it's very, very improbable that he wouldn't have been on a horse. He wouldn't have been walking that road. He probably would have been on a horse. And the sense is that God comes along and meets him and knocks him off his horse. And actually, this is a very famous painting by an Italian uh, painter called Caravaggio and it is of this scene. And actually, if you go through uh, a lot of um, uh, religious art of this period and earlier, where they're inspired by this scene, you'll have Paul on a horse. Actually, you won't have Paul on a horse. You'll have Paul next to a horse on his back with kind of this light of God shining in. It's very dramatic. And my hope is, like I said, we're going to dig into this and we're going to find why it's still quite dramatic, why should we should be kind of to this day still captured by this. So that's my hope. But um, like all good preachers, I said this morning, one of those great preacher jokes, I'm all about finding the context first because if you take the text out of context, you're left with a con. You've not heard that one before? Okay, I'm going to pretend that was new to you. Um, So there, we always need to understand what's the greater context. Now, you know you've done a bit of this, but and particularly if you go to the next slide there, this is in the very first chapter, Luke. First of all, we're to understand that this is the second part of really one book. The, uh, the writer, Luke, starts by saying, this is my second book. It's the second part of this big story where he is recording for, first of all, an audience of the day, but then also under the inspiration of the Spirit. For us, here's what happens. Here's how the kingdom of God breaks out through Jesus into the world. And again, it's a dramatic story. Um, we often kind of have carry around, I know I did for a long time before I read it properly or was pointed out to me, we often consider that uh, the Great Commission is Jesus' last words to us. Well, they're not actually. Jesus' last words are at the beginning of Acts. In Acts 1, these words here. Luke wants us to understand that. When, again, under the inspiration of the Spirit, the writers of Scripture, the way they start and what they start with is very, very important because they're saying, we want you to understand everything that comes next through this lens. And so Luke is very intentional to put these words because very much the rest of the book is just the outworking, the manifestation 
of these prophetic words from Jesus as he declares. So he's appearing to his disciples, he's speaking to his disciples, but sort of speaking to us down through the ages, through them. And he says, um, he says stay here in Jerusalem before this. Don't, don't do anything until this happens. Don't think about going out and getting all active until this happens first. And he says, then you will stay here, uh, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. I want you to grab what I just did there. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. The first little assumption here I just want us to note is that Jesus is saying you wouldn't dream of being active and kind of getting out there and doing something in my name unless something happens to you first. Wait. And something will happen. You'll receive power. You'll, you'll know about it. it. It might not be bells and whistles like Paul, uh, but something will happen and you'll know. And then because something happens to you, because you experience something, then you become something, a witness. A witness is something you are. It's not something you do. Now, I was taught, um, particularly through Scripture Union and and sort of my discipleship, all these different tools of how to witness. And they're all good. It's, you know, some of you might know the four spiritual laws and um, gospel tracts and God, man, God, what if you, what if you don't? You know that one? You kind of how to share the gospel and all these different things to help you say, this is how you witness. Well, actually, that's kind of not what what happens. If, If you are involved in an accident, and, and it's quite significant, you might be called to come and testify in a court because, not because you've learnt how to be a witness, but because something happened to you and then you'll need to come and talk about it. So being a witness, and, and Jesus wants us to understand, is something that happens because something happens to you. And I just wonder, I, I really love what, Bruce, uh, um, what Bryce was saying earlier about recognising that the... Our, our, our place in modern culture seems to be diminished. I just wonder if that's perhaps because we're trying to do too much before we've actually received something. We're trying to talk out of something that is not a lived experience at times because the idea, remember, actually as it goes on through Scripture, the language about being, about the, the, the kind of the impact of the Holy Spirit is continue to be filled by the Holy Spirit. Something will continue to happen. It's not a one-time deal. And so right at the start, Luke is saying something's going to happen. It's going to be powerful. And then out of that, you're going to become something that might involve you speaking, but it's probably going to involve you doing things. And then this thing's going to happen. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Actually, the story of Acts is how the love, the power, the impact of the kingdom of God continues to cross boundaries. It continues to break what were quite significant boundaries. Now, in our day, you have a look at a map, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, it's just, you just catch a bus to go that far. But to the first hearers, they would have understood Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. That's crossing social boundaries, cultural boundaries, political boundaries. Actually, if it's going to do this, there's a whole lot of things there that are taboo that are going to have to be broken down somehow. A whole lot of boundaries are crossed. Now again, this makes sense if we're just carrying on the work of Jesus. Think about his impact with um, the woman at the well, the woman caught in adultery, uh, the Roman centurion, the way he said, let the children come to me. There's all sorts of social, political, cultural taboos that he is breaking down saying, these are not as important as you think they are. This is what the kingdom of God does. It flows out beyond those boundaries. So as we go into and read the story of God encountering, of Jesus encountering Saul of Tarsus, look for something powerful to happen and look and think about the boundaries that are being overcome, the walls that are coming down. We'll talk that a little bit more. But let's read, because I reckon Luke and the Holy Spirit did a pretty decent job the first time around. So let's just read it and see what we find. Acts 9. 
Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Just stop there. I love that. As a first line, again, I wish I had some backing music there. It is so dramatic. Saul is breathing out murderous threats. This is not a benign little passage here. This Saul is a serious guy who's doing serious things in opposition to God's people. He went to the high priest, asked for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any way, uh, so if he found any there who belonged to the way, which was the way is Jesus belonging to Jesus, uh, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground. He heard a voice say to him, "Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord?" Saul asked. I'm um, Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men travelling with Paul, with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up, got up from the ground but when he opened his eyes he could see nothing. So they led him by hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and he did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he's seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on his name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and and their kings and to the people of Israel. Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went into the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me that you may see again, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptised. After taking some food, he regained his strength. Um, Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem? among those who call on his name? Hasn't he come here to take the prisoners to the chief priests, to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Messiah. It goes on to explain what he does and I just want to finish with the the last little verse here, in verse 31, it's quite significant. We'll come back to it. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit in increasing numbers. It's one of those little summary, Luke does this a bit, he puts little summary statements, he, he zooms in on the specific and then he zooms out and he gives a bit of a summary statement about the impact. And we'll come back to that a little later. I want to suggest to you that uh, for us to really understand the drama here that Caravaggio captures, the significance of what this uh, meant and means for us about the nature of this kingdom of God, the intent. Because we are meant to be, as the church, we are meant to be the stewards, the method, uh, sort of the delivery method of the fullness of the kingdom of God to this community, to this region. So it makes sense that we understand what, what Jesus' intent for how we would carry that, how will this move. Well, to understand this power, we've actually got to understand a bit about, quite a bit about who Saul of Tarsus is. Now we actually probably have a, if you've been around church for a while, you've probably got a pretty good idea of who Paul the Apostle is. This incredible orator, amazing mind that we see in Romans, incredible intellect, great pastoral heart, his letters, he just pours out his love, great missionary that goes on these journeys planting churches. We've got a pretty good idea of who Paul is. To get this story, you need to know who Saul of Tarsus is, because he's a very different guy. Now, we actually know, we can can piece together a pretty good 
and significant picture of who Saul of Tarsus was. And it actually starts with um, Tarsus. We've got a map here. You'll see that um, Tarsus up there in the, in the corner near Antioch, it's, it's on the south coast of what is now Turkey, um, Asia Minor. Tarsus is really important in the ancient world, a very important city. It was uh, on the trading route. It was originally, it was originally kind of colonised and came to its greatness and significance in the, the Greek Empire. So um, Alexander the Great in particular uh, founded it and, and it became a real place, uh, sort of like a university town. It was a real centre for Greek philosophy and thought. And so to grow up in Tarsus would be to grow up reasonably educated. Um, and then, of course, the, the Romans conquered the, and carried on the, the Greek Empire and they too had it as a significant part of their, um, um, of their education system. So we know that Paul, uh, sorry, Saul's family was Jewish, very devout Jews um, in the, in the uh, Pharisaical tradition. Paul later talks about himself as the son of a Pharisee. So he grew, grew up in a family that was really passionate and zealous for God and particularly the law. The Pharisees, remember, they were the ones that Jesus actually probably went hardest against in the New Testament. Uh, they were they were known to be the ones who were the gatekeepers of how to do sort of religion right, the right way. So that was what he was born into. He wasn't in an upper class because, again, by way of occupation, his family occupation was to be a leather worker or a tent, a tent maker. And that wasn't in, he wasn't sort of blue blood, he wasn't in upper class, probably middle class, but clearly his parents valued education. He would have been grounded very well and deeply in Tarsus. And it was in this context that actually this incredible rare intellect stood out and not probably around his teens, he was sent to Jerusalem to study under a rabbi called Gamaliel. Now this is significant. Gamaliel, uh, sounds like a wizard, doesn't it? Uh, was, he, he's actually recorded outside of scripture. He sort of goes down in history as one of the most esteemed rabbis and teachers and intellects of Jewish yeah, um, history. And so to study under Gamaliel was, that was, uh, that was something right there. Like if you were a Pharisee, to then actually study under Gamaliel, you, you went up a notch. But not only that, but Paul actually was head of the class. Saul, sorry. He was head of the class. So here is a guy whose entire identity and life up to this point was about being right. I am right and I am righteous. Now, any of you who have been married or are married know that that's a very dangerous way to travel through life. In fact, anyone who's in a relationship knows that in a a relationship, if you've got one person who understands themselves to be the one who is right, how well does that go? Do you know what relationship that is no more true of, that's true the most? the most dangerous for you to assume yourself to be the one who is right and righteous? It's with God. That, that's actually the, the, part of the good news of the Gospel of Jesus Christ is to be powerful is to be wrong, is to be humble. It's actually a very, very good position to be. Jesus himself said, blessed are those who are meek, who hunger and thirst after righteousness, but recognise their need for God. Well, Paul is the exact opposite of this. And in fact, he is so offended, Saul is so offended by this ragtag bunch of people going around claiming that the son of a peasant from Nazareth is the Messiah. It's almost impossible for us to get the sense of outrage that Saul the Pharisee, student of Gamaliel, would have felt. The pure offence. So he declared himself number one enemy of this new cult. Not only that, but they were claiming the idea that the divine, this is where his Greek thinking, to try and get a, a sense inside of, Saul, uh, inside of Saul, the way in which the Greek Stoic tradition would have understood that the divine has nothing to do with the earthly. So the idea that God would come down like this, and, and, and come into humanity. 
through this unwed Jewish woman on the backside in a small, insignificant place. To him, it doesn't even make sense. It's, it's like to a, to a Greek philosopher, you're saying black is white. And so the idea that these guys were moving through and gaining influence enraged him. And to the point where, again, I'll make this point, there would have been no one on the planet more unlikely to be a follower of Jesus than Saul of Tarsus. That's the starting point. And effectively, and particularly because of that pride, that idea that I am right. I'm not just right in this occasion, I am always right. My identity, my job, is to be right and actually tell you when you're not right. I'm the gatekeeper. What happens is, and this this is not for Saul, this is for us, brick by brick, stone by stone, we build a wall around our hearts. And there is a boundary. And this is where the grand narrative of the gospel breaking down barriers comes hitting. It's it's true geographically. It's true culturally. It's true politically. It's really, really true personally. And so God comes along to this man who has built a wall of stone around his heart that is impenetrable. God knocks him off his horse. Isn't that good news? Don't you think that's good news? I can be that. I can be that guy. Maybe I don't have the intellect to probably back it up that Saul would have, but I can be that guy. I've been that guy. I know people who, to me, seem like the unlikeliest people ever to come to Christ. Talk about a wall. They've invested. They've dug those foundations in. They've got. They've over-engineered that thing. How is it even possible that they would ever meet Jesus? But we come to Acts 9 and we go, thank God that whatever wall we build up or can be built up, God is greater. This is not a new story. Just as Acts is this great narrative of God's people going into and taking the kingdom out into new places, think of Joshua and the the conquest of the promised land. They get to the edge of the promised land. They step in. The first, when they're going into the fullness of what symbolises the fullness of the promises of God, what's the first place they come up against that they've got to take? Testing biblical knowledge here. What's the first city? Jericho. Tell me about Jericho. Walls. It's not a mistake. It's not a, that's not a nice little trivia coincidence. This is because this is what happens. And so what does... What does God say for God's people to do when you come up against boundaries? It was a bit weird. I mean, I would have said to Josh, you want us to do what? March around it seven times and just pray and praise and blow some trumpets and... Yep, yeah, seven times. Just circle that wall, name it, point to it. That's the wall that's got to come down and then just circle it in prayer. Circle it in prayer and praise. And the sense is, that on that seventh time around, it has been so eroded by the power of the Spirit of God through prayer, through God's people marching in faith, naming and saying, that wall's got to come down because what's inside is God's. That's God's territory. He's got to claim on that for greater purposes. The power of that is so strong that it's the sense in which, and I might be stretching it here, but I've got the mic and I'm going to do it anyway. The sense is that even the sound waves of a shout will be enough then for it to crumble. Isn't that good news? Because I believe that's true. I'm not just telling you some story here. I believe that's actually what... I'm convinced that's what the Spirit of God is saying to us this morning. That whatever boundary that you think stands in the way of God, the good news, the grace, the forgiveness, the love, the compassion, the blessing of God flowing into your family, flowing into your school, flowing into your workplace, flowing into this community. Whatever boundary you see is in the way, name it, circle it in prayer. Circle it in prayer and pray and it will be eroded. And you know what? We know that about Paul. We know that someone, actually we, we know that probably many people were praying for Paul, but actually Luke wants us to understand 
Again, if we make a connection to Acts 7, that would have been a couple of weeks ago, there was one very significant person who prayed for Paul. Remember who it was? Stephen. As Paul, as Saul is not just breathing out but acting out murderous threats, Stephen, the very first martyr, we're there. It's right in, again, a moment of high drama where he is surrounded. He is being literally... I mean, we talk about persecuted when people use bad words against us. They're throwing stones. They're, they're killing the God. And he cries out. Not just some sort of disembodied, pious prayer, but he says, God, don't hold this against them. Don't hold this against them. Who's there? Luke wants us to know who's there. It's a little side note, but Luke wants to be really clear about who is there holding the coat, actually condoning it. It's Saul. He's praying for Saul. He's he's pointing to that wall around their hearts, the wall of righteousness of Christ. We've got this figured out. We know who's in and who's out. He's naming and saying, no, no, that wall can't stand. That man, Saul of Tarsus, you're God. I'm claiming you for a greater purpose. And then two chapters on, we see this dramatic story. Now, now Paul has to be encountered by God quite because he's very literally going in the wrong direction. As I finish this morning, I, I want to, I guess, ground this in a challenge to all of us and I, I really place myself in the middle of this. But the first is to us personally. Um, I, I'm assuming most of us here this morning uh, have made a decision and maybe you've had some sort of encounter, maybe it was profound and dramatic, maybe it was just quite simple and straightforward, but you've, you're here this morning sitting through this heat, not because you think this is the best place to, you know, climate-wise to be on a Sunday morning, but because you are committed to Jesus, you identify as a follower of Jesus. When's the last time God knocked you off your horse? Not because you were running away, but because you recognise that that's what followers of Jesus need to do, to keep fronting up and and exposing your heart to God. When was the last time you opened your scripture and kind of went, oh God, that's good. Last time in personal devotion you had, you you just were reflecting on something, something in your heart went, oh God, that's great. If you're not choosing to do that, then the other option will be well, the other, seems the other methodology is eventually God might knock you off your horse in a rather painful way. I've done both. I know which one in maturity looks like following Jesus is a better way to go. So my, my first challenge to all of us this morning, when is the last time God knocked you off your horse? And if it's been a while, so that you are witness to the living power of God in you. You can be a witness, not just talk historically about something happened, but you can be a witness. Uh, that, that, that's something I'll leave with you this morning. I know, I know in preparation I'll be challenged about that. Again. Here's the next thing I want to leave with you as well as you take one step out from that. Who, in the way in which we, we might look at Saul, if we were alive at the time and looked at Saul and go, that is the last guy on the planet who is ever going to commit to following Jesus. You know, that is the last. Who's that in your life? Who's that? Quite possibly someone in your family. They seem to be the ones that are most challenging, hardest to reach, probably most difficult for us. Maybe you've had a, you've tried to share and it's just the walls go up. I just invite you this morning, I, I, I pray and, and invite you to come and just let, be encouraged by the Spirit of God saying, no, nah, that's, that's nothing. That's nothing for me. Lift them up in prayer. Circle them in prayer. Name them in prayer. Name the walls in prayer. And then actually, as we saw briefly there, actually, I, I, we don't have time to dwell on this, and Ananias, Barnabas, what did they come and do? They just came and served them. They were courageously turned up while they still thought it was Saul, while it was still dangerous, life threatening. What did those guys do? They just came and served them and loved them. They were obedient to God. Don't be surprised when you name them in prayer that God might also say, I want you to go and serve them. Go and turn up. I know that's going to take courage. Don't go and tell them something. Turn up and serve them. And I love the theme that you guys are looking at here this morning. I think it fits well. The last thing as we, as we finish. As you, look, as you look outside these walls, and can't these walls become like walls, if we're honest? Can't these walls 
can become a barrier that God has to knock down for his church. It's sad, but we've got to name the possibility that these walls can become... But what are the barriers outside? What are the boundaries that need to be named and circled? In your community, I'm, I'm so encouraged and I've heard you know, previously about your, the work in schools and the coach program. And the shine, you're, you're doing lots, but there are more. You know there are more boundaries. What are the kind of political or, or the, the kind of ideological boundaries that actually God's got to break down? Not you, God. Name them. Come together. Pray for them. And then how do you serve them? How do you serve them? So I encourage you to take this away. This is a dramatic story. Its power is if it's true for you today, here, now, what it means for you. It's a nice, interesting story. We can understand, wow, that's great that it happened. Its real power is that it happens when you place yourself in this story as the Church of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, uh, I thank you for your word, your living word, that when we come with open hands and open hearts, open minds, we can encounter the Spirit of God speaking to us. And I know that's been my experience. Lord God, I pray right now that your Spirit would be in those three areas of challenge where when's the last time we encountered you in a way that just blew us away, knocked us off, whatever that looks like, private, public, that doesn't really, that's not the issue. The way in which we, we, were, we so encountered your reality that we became a witness to something real and living that we can live out of. Lord, we want to bring before you those people that just to us it seems impossible, but we just proclaim and declare all things are possible. To you all things are possible. Would you knock down the boundaries in their lives? Would you show us ways we can come and be an Ananias and Barnabas, son of encouragement to those people? And then, Lord, for this church, as it enters into a new season, as it continues to carry forward all of the great initiatives and already boundaries that have been crossed, Lord God, I pray that they would be a courageous church, just like the early church, that continue to flow with your spirit to see your good news, the kingdom of God, just overcome boundaries, erode the walls, so that we would be a part of your, the good news of your kingdom going to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and the ends of the earth. I pray blessing and the fullness of your spirit on this church in Jesus' name. Amen.